thank you, Emily, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so wait for this slide to pass over. Here we go. So yeah, uh, uh, here at Ether, we're a drone solutions company. Uh, we operate out of Chichester. Uh, we're a distributor of a lot of drone hardware, including DJI, uh, yellow scan and quantum systems. Um, we're also able to organize product repairs for this and assist you with any sort of concerns you may have with them. Uh, we distribute companion software for UAV equipment, and this can include mapping and flight planning software. And we're also uh, deal with consultancy. So we want to support you in every step of the way of integrating drones into your business. We will answer any questions you have and just help you every step of the way. So in today's webinar, I'm going to be sharing some information to help pilots use their drones, as well as maintenance and care tips that will hopefully extend their lifespan. Uh, most of what I'll be discussing today, particularly when referring to software, is based on DJI products, but I'm also going to talk about care and maintenance tips that should be able to apply to all drone models, not just DJI. Uh, a lot of the topics that I'll be going through today are based on support questions that we regularly receive from our clients. So hopefully there will be some use to you and you'll be able to use them yourselves. Uh, so the main topics I'm going to be covering today are DJI controller applications, uh, which ones work with your drones and how to install them. Uh, DJI Assistant 2, I'll be discussing its functionality and the various versions available to you. Uh, Pre-flight care, um, this will mainly cover sensor calibration and firmware updating for your drones. Uh, after that, we're going to post-flight care, where I'll share some tips for looking after your drones and maintaining them after you've completed your missions. And then finally, we're gonna move on to battery health management, uh, which is probably the biggest section that's most important. Uh, the best way is to look after your drone batteries and extend their lifespan. Uh, so before we get started properly, I just want to apologize if there's any background audio from my mic. Um, I'm out on a job at the minute, so I'm hosting from a cafe. So apologies if you can hear anything in the background. Okay, it may seem like a basic place to start, but I'm initially going to cover the DJI controller apps, which ones you may require and where to find them and how to install them. So DJI have created several apps that allow users to control their aircraft from their phone or smart device. Uh, these are really user-friendly and they're full of features. Uh, the apps allow pilots to control their aircraft, view left feed from the vision system or payload and plan and execute flight missions. Uh, users are able to conveniently view aircraft data and adjust settings. Uh, essentially, it's all the features you can expect on um, a controller with an integrated uh, screen. Um, and that's mainly because it's the same software in both. Uh, the app is basically running on the DJI and smart controllers. So as I mentioned, there are several different controller apps available. Um, the one you require is solely dependent on which drone model you are using. So um, current, there's, there's the three main DJI apps currently in circulation, which are DJI Pilot, DJI Go4, and DJI Fly. Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to cover what aircraft apps these should work with for you. Um, there are more, more, than, more apps than that available to you, but um, these are the three main ones used for DJI's current range of drones, and they're the ones we might receive the most support, support requests regarding. Okay, so we'll start with DJI Go 4. Uh, DJI Go 4 is the standard app used for controlling following drones. So we've got the Mavic 2, which is the standard edition, not the Enterprise, any of the Enterprise series. It's just the standard version of the Mavic 2. The Mavic Air, the DJI Spark, all models of the Phantom 4, other than the RTK, uh, the DJI Inspire 2, the Mavic Pro, the Matrice 200, and the Matrice 210, both in the standard and RTK setup. Uh, DJI Go 4 can be installed on iOS 10 and above and Android 5 and above. Uh, as you can probably see, the app supports some of the older model of DJI drones. So this is, um, this is one of the older apps. Um, this is the oldest of the three apps that I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, the next apps we're going to talk about are slightly newer and um, 
they cover are split more between enterprise and consumer drones. So DJI Fly is the latter of the two options offering support for consumers. Um, it covers the Mavic 3, the full range of the Mavic Minis, the Air 2 and 2S, and the DJI FPV. Uh, again, Fly is available for both on iOS and Android, provided you're running the correct version, which you can see there. Uh, DJI Fly is integrated into the um, DJI Mini's uh, flight transmitter, which means um, if you're using that, you won't actually have to download it onto your app, onto your phone even, sorry. Okay, and finally, I'm going to move on to the DJI Pilot app, which is DJI's enterprise app, um, which supports the following drones which are used in industry. So it's the full Mavic 2 Enterprise range, which covers the Jewel, the Zoom, and the Enterprise Advance, uh, the Matrice 200 versions 1 and 2, uh, the Phantom 4 RTK, and the Matrice 600 Pro. Uh, it's also important to note that DJI Pilot runs on the Enterprise Smart Controllers for the Matrice 300 and the M30. OK, so moving on to how to install these apps. So if you're an Apple user, then good news, you can easily install the DJI apps you require from the App Store. Easy as that. If you're an Android user like me, it's not quite so convenient, unfortunately. Uh, the DJI apps have some issues on the DJI Store. Oh, not, not the DJI Store, what am I saying? Uh, they have some issues on the Google Play Store. Um, I'm not gonna go into what they are now, but either they don't show up when you search for them or they're no longer kept updated. So if you're an Android user, then we recommend downloading the required DJI apps directly from their website's download page, which is um, linked in the PowerPoint. And I believe Emily's going to drop the link in chat as well for you if you need it. So um, it's not a difficult process downloading them this way, but I will go through it on the next slide anyway, just to, um, just to cover it for you guys. Ah, I did have a video on this slide, but it seems to have disappeared. But not to worry, I'll just try and describe perfectly what it was showing you. Um, yeah, so basically, when you're downloading an app or an APK file off the internet, uh, your Android system isn't initially going to like it. It's going to recognize it as an untrustworthy source. So before you download your APK file from the DJI website, you need to ensure your phone is able to install apps from unknown sources. Uh, to do this, navigate to your phone settings and find the apps menu. Uh, from there, select the three dots icon in the upper right corner and select the special access, which is revealed in a drop-down menu there. Uh, from the list of apps that appear, find the web browser that you commonly use or that you prefer to use for downloads and uh, click on it. And from there, there should be an option to allow unknown app down installations and then downloads. So if you just flick that switch, that'll be fine. And you can go right ahead and download the APK file. Uh, once it's downloaded, all you need to tap, do is tap on it on your notifications bar and it should automatically install. Ewan, if you um, press the button one more time, it should it should get the video up. You just have to click forward ah, one perfect. more. Perfect. There we go. Tech solutions. <laughs> okay, let's get that playing. Now. If I can. It doesn't appear to want to play, but not to worry. OK, we'll move on to DJI Assistant then. So DJI Assistant 2 is a really handy piece of PC companion software for your drones, payloads, and any other peripherals. Uh, when you connect a DJI device to Assistant, you'll be able to view and control the drone's firmware, either update it and revert it. This works for the drone transmitter and DJI payloads. You can also view and configure some drone files in Assistant. For example, data can be uploaded to the PC from the drone's internal storage or from the removable SD, which can be handy instead of taking the SD card in and out if you're worried you're going to lose it. A really handy function of Assistant 2 is uh, setting the drone's flight logs. Uh, this allows you to retain information from all your drone's flight, but it's particularly useful as it allows you to view errors and diagnose problems that might have occurred in flight. So a lot of you, when you're flying, you might see a little notification message pop up in your top left corner of your screen and you'll be busy flying and you don't have time to fully 
fully interpret, I guess. So you can go back later and you can go into the flight logs and you can see what errors are coming up and whether it's something you need to address. Uh, Assistant 2 is the only place that you'll be able to calibrate the vision systems of your DJI drones, uh, but that's something I'm going to go into in more depth later. And DJI Assistant also has an integrated flight simulator or flight simulator light. It's a fairly basic, but it's a helpful tool if you're looking to get a little bit of drone practice before you go out flying. Uh, it's not explicitly explained how to use the simulator on Assistant, so I'm just going to go through it quickly now. Uh, to remove the sim, you need to first make sure you remove the props from your aircraft. That's really important. And then you need to plug your drone into the PC via USB cable and power it on. After that, power up the transmitter and connect it to the drone. And finally, launch DDI Assistant 2 and start the simulator. Um, from there, you should be able to use the controller to uh, simulate a flight as you would out in the field. And you'll see a lot of data uh, on the side of the screen and a very basic green and blue world that you can fly around in. Okay, so onto the different versions of Assistant 2. As this is DJI, there's no way we could just have one version. You need to, um, you need to separate out through the different drones just to make it easy for you. So um, the version of DJI Assistant you require is dependent on the model of drone you're using. All versions of DJI Assistant are available on the downloads page of the DJI website. Um, again, it's there and Emily would have shared it in the chat for you. It's a little easier to work out which versions of Assistant you need compared to the pilot apps, as the, um, the title of the drone models is usually within the, um, within the name of the app. So uh, the main versions are Assistant for Enterprise, Assistant for Mavic, and Assistant for Phantom. Uh, the other main consumer drones are covered within the DJI Assistant 2 consumer drone series. Uh, there are other versions of Assistant 2 also available for DJI Ronin and DJI FPV, but um, it's not too important. I don't will need to cover that. So yeah, as you can see there on the side, DJI for Assistant Enterprise covers well, the Enterprise series drones, the Mavic for the Mavic drones, the Phantom for all of the Phantom series, not just the um, P4 RTK, and then the consumer for everything else you might need. Okay, so before I move on, uh, I just wanna pause quickly if anyone's got any questions about what I've just gone over before I move to pre-flight care. If you just wanna raise your hands for anything. Okay then, so moving on, I want to discuss pre-flight drone care. Uh, these are the things that you should be regularly doing to care for your drone and ensure it's safe to fly before you go out into the field. Um, in this section, I'm mainly gonna be discussing the calibration of the drone systems. So calibration has to be carried out separately for all the different sensor modules in the drone. And this includes the IMU, the compass and the visual system. I'm also gonna be going through updating firmware for drones and their peripherals. So again, fairly standard stuff, but it's good to know and it's good to know how to do it properly. Okay, so first we're going to cover the compass. Uh, the compass is a very important module in your drone. If you hadn't guessed from the name, the compass determines the drone's heading and the orientation while in flight. It's really important to keep the module cal calibrated or your drone may behave erratically or not respond properly to your inputs when it's in flight. It, just, it might get upset and not know where it is properly. Uh, to calibrate this module, you need to navigate to the sensors menu within the drone settings on your controller. So this should be in the top right on the mission screen, three dots, and then it's in the, um, the drone settings menu and it'll say service, uh, sensor status. Uh, once you've clicked on the sensor status, you should be able to see a menu for the IMU and for the compass. Um, if you select the compass option, you may be able to see more than one module show up, but that's okay. Um, 
these drones often have built-in redundancy, so there'll be multiple compass systems within it that need calibration. Okay, so compass calibration should be carried out in large open spaces away from electromagnetic interference. Um, there's nothing worse for a compass than to something, some EM interference skewing the calibration. It's not recommended to calibrate it indoors or near large metal structures like fences or barns just because they really can interfere with the, uh, with the sensor. Um, it's quite unfortunate they have to calibrate the module outdoors because you do look quite silly doing it. So essentially you have to hold the drone above your head at a height of about 1.5 meters and you need to turn a full 360 degree circle once holding it horizontally and once holding it vertically, as you can see in the diagram in the bottom right corner there. So yeah, you, you have to do a funny little dance and you look a bit ridiculous, but it's, it's an important thing to do. Uh, DJI recommends calibrating your compass every 30 days when you're flying more than 50 kilometers from your last location or when you're in an area with strong EM interference. Uh, you might also be prompted to calibrate uh, by the controller. Um, to be honest, I would recommend just checking the sensor status and maybe calibrating before every flight mission. It really doesn't take long and it just ensures everything is okay before you go out and fly. Okay, so on to the IMU. So IMU refers to the drone's internal measurement unit. Uh, the IMU detects changes in the drone's acceleration and orientation to calculate its current position and velocity. Uh, again, if it's not calibrated regularly, the flight performance can be quite negatively affected. So we want to keep that IMU nice and calibrated. So as I said on the last slide, you can find the IMU calibration in the sensor status menu of the drone settings. Simply navigate to that tab and select IMU. And generally, you'll see four bars for IMU, but again, that could change depending on how many redundant systems there are within the drone. So IMU calibration requires you to sit the, the drone on a level surface. Uh, you might be able to see that in the, um, the diagram to the right, or the uh, controller interface on the right. So yeah, you need to place the drone on level surfaces. So I would recommend completing IMU calibrations indoors as opposed to outdoors which is a little bit annoying given you need to be outdoors for compass, but hey, hey. So calibration for the IMU is fairly simple. Um, drone has to be balanced on all faces and the controller will show an image of the face that it needs to be on currently and how long to leave it there for. Um, real simple process, actually. Uh, it's recommended by DJI to calibrate the IMU every six months or if the drone has been handled quite roughly or when it's um, been flown quite roughly, particularly if it's had a, a rough landing, just because that can knock some of the sensors and it might, it might be quite unhappy afterwards. But again, there's no harm in calibrating the IMU whenever you want to, it's, it's not gonna hurt. Okay, so the final sensor calibration I'm gonna go through now is the vision system. So the drone's vision system refers to the cameras and sensors mounted on various faces of the drone that the drone uses to perceive entities surrounding it and avoid obstacles. Pretty key system, isn't it? So um, it's, it's incredibly important to keep the vision system accurate as obstacle avoidance is probably the best way to protect your drone from user input errors. Um, stops you from flying into any trees that might be out there. So good way to prevent damage. Um, so for DJI drones, the vision system is calibrated through Assistant 2. So you want to connect your drone to the PC via USB cable, power it on, and then open DJI Assistant 2 and select the calibration tab. So the method for calibration changes slightly depending on the size of your drone. So for handheld drones, sort of the size of the Phantom 4 or the Mavic 2, as, as you can see in the picture to the right, they're calibrated by holding the drone and pointing the vision systems at your PC monitor. And during this, your PC monitor will display a grid of dots, a blue target region and a box that indicates where your vision system is pointing. And so basically to calibrate this system, the blue box will move around the, move around the grid 
and you'll need to follow that box with your drone's vision system. It's um, It can be fairly clunky. You can occasionally have to get your drone quite close to your monitor and the cable can be a bit in the way, but it's not a difficult process. You should be able to do it. And the um, assistant team will talk you through the process as you go. So larger drones like the M300 are a little bit different and they come with a calibration board instead. So the calibration board looks exactly like the grid of dots that will appear on your monitor for the smaller drones. Essentially, you'll plug your larger drone into DJI System 2, you'll go to the calibration tab, and it will ask you to hold this board in front of the vision systems, and it will ask you to first uh, tilt the board horizont uh, horizontally and then vertically. Um, it will be, it'll show you on the uh, screen what you need to be doing. So again, it's all quite self-explanatory. Uh, so the vision system, it's not really recommended how many or how often you need to be doing it. You'll usually be told by your controller if the vision system wants calibration. But again, it's not a long process really. Every so often I would recommend you just complete it just for peace of mind and to make sure everything's working as it should. Okay, moving on to firmware then. So as you know, firmware basically is the um, is the operating is the operating of your drone's software. So um, the standard way of updating your drone's firmware is through um, is via your controller. Uh, providing your transmitter is connected to the internet, when an update is available for your drone, the controller, batteries, or payloads, it should automatically appear on the home screen of the app when the drone is turned on. Um, if, the update, if the update does not automatically appear for you, uh, you might be able to search for it in the, in the controller if you go to the HMS settings in the, in the transmitter and um, you refresh the firmware, it might, it might kickstart it into finding the new version that's available. So um, it's not on the slide, but you need to ensure that your batteries, both for the drone and for your controller, are above 50% when you're doing this just to make sure that neither of them shut off halfway through the firmware and corrupt everything. Okay, so updating via Assistant 2. If for some reason your controller didn't find the updates that you know have come out, uh, you can connect to Assistant 2 and search for them there. So again, you just connect your drone via drone or your controller via USB cable and power it on. It should appear on Assistant 2, and you can navigate yourself to the firmware update tab. From here, it's a really straightforward process. You simply select the uh, version you want to install and click install. Um, again, you want to make sure your device has more than 50% battery for that. Uh, a good thing about Assistant 2, actually, is that um, when you, you don't only have to re, uh, update the firmware, but you can also revert it. So if you're having problems with the newest version, for some reason or it's not it's not happy with one of your payloads you can revert it and you can troubleshoot some of the problems you're having which is quite handy actually okay so offline updates so this isn't relevant for all models of drone but it's relevant for the enterprise range of dji products so dji enterprise products are able to complete offline firmware updates and by that i mean a controller which isn't connected to the internet um, at some point in the stage, in, yeah, sorry, at some point in the process, though, you will require an internet connection just to access the initial files. So, the firmware packages can be found on the downloads page that Emily's linked for you in chat, and it will be within the relevant enterprise, uh, the relevant page for the enterprise drone. So, um, if you want the M300 files, you simply need to go to the DJI website, DJI M300, and then navigate to downloads. And it should be one of the first links available to you there. It's all quite easy. So yeah, um, you want to download those files and you want to put them into an SD card. Uh, once it's saved on that SD card, the SD card can then be inserted into the controller at any time to finish up the update. So um, I've got a little video running on the side here. This one's actually working, luckily. So yeah, if you, um, if you navigate to the HMS settings of your controller, uh, you select the firmware tab and then you select offline update. You should see this menu here, which is um, 
all the different peripherals and payloads connected to your drone and the option to select a firmware file. If you simply select update all, then everything, everything will do what, what you want it to. Um, again, I'm just going to quickly pause at the end of that section for any questions you guys might have. Okay, I think you're all happy with that. Moving on then. So post-flight care. So best, one of the best ways to extend your drone's lifespan is just to just carry out a few checks after you've completed a mission. It's quick, doesn't take any of your time, and it can really extend your lifespan if, if you're careful. So, um, sorry. All of these checks can be completed with a basic set of tools. Uh, generally, you will get a, you will want a couple of precision Phillips head screwdrivers, some Allen keys ranging between one and three millimeters, and a few microfiber cloths and a can of compressed air. If you've got that, you should have everything you need to carry out some basic maintenance on your drones, whether it's in the field or when you get back to your office and you're and you're doing some work on it. So. In terms of care, I'm going to break it down a little bit into motors and propellers, inspection and cleaning, uh, general inspections for the rest of the airframe, and then finally gimbal and payload care. Okay, so let's start with the motors. Uh, when the motors have powered down after a flight, it's good to inspect them by just twisting them gently in both directions. Uh, there shouldn't be any significant resistance to this motion but you should be able to sort of feel slight notches as you turn it, as the, as the state is past the magnets on the outside of the motor. So that's completely fine if you feel that little jumpiness. But if there is significant resistance to the motion, then there's a problem with the motor. It won't function properly in flight and you might end up with a drone falling out of the sky. So if there is significant resistance to the motion, I would recommend sending your drone off for repair so we can, so we can change that motor. Um, if when you turn it, you feel sort of a gritty sound or a gritty feeling when you're rotating it, then there's likely to be a slight particulate buildup in it. This can happen if you're landing, um, particularly in dusty places, it can get into the holes and vents in the motor and just sort of clog up a bit. So this isn't as serious as, as, serious as an issue. If you have your compressed air, you should be able to easily uh, clear the blockage by just squirting in the gaps and uh, continuing to twist it. So yeah, I'd verify the gritty feeling is gone before you fly your drone again, but it's a fairly simple fix. Uh, once you've completed those checks, I would recommend just going once over with a microfiber cloth just to dry off the motors and just make sure there's no other particulates in the area. You don't want them to get into the motor during transit. Okay, so propeller checks and propeller replacement. Uh, after a flight, props should be inspected for signs of damage. Uh, I would recommend you do this every time you finish a flight, but it really is essential if you think your props have made contact with an object in flight, like a tree or something. Really important because without a healthy prop, your drone's liable to fall out the air. Okay, so to inspect your props, you need to run your finger and your thumb over both sides of the uh, propeller feeling for any irregularities. Um, you then want to sort of slightly bend. You want to slightly bend the props, not too much force, but they, they should have a little bit of give. And you want to bend it up and down. Uh, and doing this, you should reveal any cracks within the, um, within the propeller. So um, slight sur surface scuffs are to be expected, but if you, if when doing this, you notice cracks that run into the, uh, into the surface, then, uh, the, the prop will need replacing. You don't want any cracks because they're just liable to grow and then become worse. So for smaller drones like the P4 and the Mavic 2 range, um, these uh, props are quick release. So you don't need any screwdrivers or anything to get these off. 
uh, you just need to push in and rotate. Uh, P4 users, you should know this because you need to do this every time you put your drone away. But um, for large drones like the M300, you need, um, they use hex screws to secure their props. So when you're untying these screws, you need to be really careful because it's, it can be quite easy to strip the hex bolt. So you wanna make sure you're using exactly the right Allen key and you wanna put a nice amount of pressure down and then gently twist. Uh, anything more than that, then it is, like, it is liable to slip and you really don't want that problem on your hand. It really makes things a lot more difficult for you. So uh, it's also important that when you're replacing these screws, you're not over tightening them. So you want them to be secure, but you don't want to properly force them in as it, it can add extra stress to the airframe and can result in cracks later down the line. Uh, we also recommend using Loctite, which you can pick up quite cheaply off Amazon when you're replacing these screws. So Loctite is just another way of adding a bit more security to the screws when they're, when they're in your drone. Okay. So when you're replacing your props, you need to make sure that the pattern or the color on the motor mount matches the, the pattern on the new prop. Uh, essentially this pattern or color code refers to the direction that the motor will spin. And uh, if you mount the props to the wrong motors, then your, your drone's not going anywhere. It won't take off. So you need to make sure the proper pilot orientations are on the right motors. So as you can see on the picture on the right there for the, uh, the P4 propellers, you've got a little black ring on one of them. And on the other, it's a sort of silvery color. And um, it's, it's a sort of similar pattern on all the DJI drones and all basic models really. So um, it's recommended to replace your propellers after 12 months or after 50 flight hours. Even if you don't see any signs of damage of them, they just, it's good to not let them get too worn and it's good to replace them every so often. Okay, so moving on to some more general checks. So after a flight, you want to inspect your airframe for cracks and scratches. Again, surface blemishes can be expected with regular use. Scratches that seem to penetrate the shell surface are an issue. Uh, they're likely to grow and they can cause serious damage and they can um, allow water ingress, which is something you really don't want. Um, okay, so after flights, you wanna, you wanna sort of wipe down the entire, um, the entire airframe as well, uh, particularly the vision systems and the sensors that go along with them. You don't want any sort of fingerprints or grit on these lenses when you put them away, just because it's liable to damage them or get scratches them while in transit. And you really don't want a damaged vision system. Uh, you, another really important one is you want to clean the landing gear before you put your drone back in the case. So a microfiber cloth should do this, but you just really want to make sure you remove any particulates that might be clinging to the landing gear. So especially things like dirt or little gravelly bits, because essentially you don't want these in your, in your transport case. Uh, in transit, this gritty stuff is liable to float about in the case and scratch the lenses of your expensive drone. So um, again, also with the landing gear, you want to make sure there's no, again, there's no cracks. Uh, so cracks are liable to appear on the base or at the connection point to the rest of the airframe where it's under stress. Um, again, if you do find these cracks, it's really important that you, that you get it all replaced and back to work in order because you don't want to uh, have a particularly rough landing with your drone and find that it buckles underneath itself. Um, so the next one's not one that you need to do every time you fly, but it's, it's good to do it regularly. So occasionally you should be checking the screws in your airframe or all secure. So generally this can be uh, checked with your set of Allen keys, the one to three millimeter ones. Uh, so you should just want to insert the Allen key and you want to see if there's any give in the screw. If it does feel loose, you feel free to tighten up. It's good to make it secure. But like I said before, you don't want to apply any extra force than, than it's needed. You don't want to add any strain to the airframe that will result in cracks later down the line. So gimbals and payloads. Uh, 
again, it's all fairly basic stuff, but you want to ensure you keep a secure grip on the payload when you're disconnecting it from a Skyport. So I'd recommend just holding it with both hands and making sure you've got a secure grip when it drops, as you, you don't want your cameras smashing on the ground after the flight. That would be quite unfortunate. Uh, when an external payload is in operation, you want to make sure you keep hold of the Skyport cap. Um, so the cap for the Skyport on the drone side, as well as the one on the payload side. Uh, so essentially these covers pr pr protect the uh, Skyport from damage during transit. So if there are any particulates floating about in your case, they won't get into the, they won't get into the port and prevent your payloads from working properly. So I would recommend just screwing the two caps together for the Skyport and then just slipping them in your pocket so you can keep track of them. So it's, it's not something that would stop the drone from flying if that port got damaged, but it, it really would stop the payload from functioning properly, which is arguably the most important part of your drone. So as with the vision system, you want to ensure that all lenses of the payload and sensors are clean of fingerprints and particulates. So use a lens wipe or use the microfiber cloths and just give them a, a little once over before you put the caps on them and you pop them away. So again, you're just stopping any damage that might occur during transit. So uh, the next one's quite a big one, actually. Um, when you unbox your drones, a lot of people seem to throw away the, um, the payload support pieces. So for the Phantom 4, this is two foam pieces that hold the payload in place. Or for the Mavic range, it's a plastic cover or a harness. And um, these support pieces are actually really, really important. And you don't want to be throwing them away. So when the drones are in the case without these support pieces, the gimbal is liable to freely rotate and it, it just can, it can cause damage and it can overload the motor within it. So just pop the, pop the support pieces in your pocket when you fly and pop them back on at the end of your mission. Uh, simple stuff, but it's just good to keep doing it. Uh, it's important to remember though, when you go out to fly again next time, you do want to take these support pieces off, otherwise you're your gimbal won't initialize properly and it can result in damage as well. So last on this section, the um, if your drone has rubber gimbal dampers, uh, such as in the M300, these should also be checked for signs of damage. Uh, this damage on the uh, gimbal dampers usually presents itself as a white goo leaking from them. It's, it's quite unpleasant, but it's quite obvious as well. So if you do notice this damage, you want to remove the damage damper. So you can do this by sort of squeezing them through the gimbal module with some tweezers. And just after, once you've got them out, throw them away. When you've got some new ones, you want to gently stretch them through the holes you revealed in the gimbal module. But you want to make sure that you're not adding any stress to the bulb section. You only want to be uh, folding and stretching the sort of disc sections on either side. If you do that, then there should be no issues and you should be able to reattach the gimbal damper very easily. Okay, so yeah, uh, one last brief pause to ask about any questions on that section. Anything you want to check with or? You in? Uh, yeah. Hello, you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, go ahead. It's uh, Jeremy here. Um, just a quick question. Um, I've got a Matrice 300, it's got an IP45 rating. Does right. that mean that the controller also has an IP45 rating? Yes, it should do. They should be able to operate in the same environments that the drone is functioning in. Okay, okay thank you. No worries at all. Is there anything else? Okay, so the last section I'm going to be talking through today is battery health management. So batteries are the only consumable part of your drone, and annoyingly, they are also the hardest to look after. So I'm going to go over some of the best ways to keep your batteries happy and healthy for as long as possible, because we don't want to be replacing them if we don't have to. So the first thing I recommend is to always label all of your drone batteries. And for drones which require more than one battery, always keep them in the same battery pairs. So for example, I would, I would label battery pairs 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, et cetera. 
So this helps you keep track of the drones, the batteries you've used and how often you use them, which is important for reasons I'll be covering in the next few slides. It's really important that batteries are charged correctly and safely and then stored within the recommended temperature ranges. Uh, again, I'm going to be going into more detail on all this in the next few slides, so don't worry. So essentially, batteries that you don't look after properly and take care of properly, they're going to have a far shorter lifespan than they're intended to. And they can behave unpredictably and unexpectedly when you're flying. So it's just good to look after them and keep them healthy. Unfortunately, if your, if your battery shows any signs of damage or any significant faults, it's likely that it's going to have to be thrown away and disposed of. But again, I'll go over proper ways to safely do that later because they can be quite volatile and they can cause serious damage if not disposed of properly. Okay, so first up, we're going to go on battery firmware. So we did cover firmware updates earlier, but battery firmware can be very slightly different and, and can be updated independently from the aircraft. So ensure the batteries and the controller are above 50% again before starting this. So the first update method is the same as the one we discussed before. Batteries can be inserted to the airframe. When booted, the controller should alert you of available updates for the batteries and anything else that's connected and, and everything will update. But it's important to remember that this process has to be repeated for all the batteries to use with your aircraft, which can be quite a time consuming. So for some drones which have batteries compatible with a battery station, uh, you can actually speed this process up. So um, uh, the batteries can be inserted into the battery station, such as a BS60, and um, connect the controller to the BS60 and boot it. If you go into the firmware settings of the controller then, you should be able to find the battery station as well as all the batteries connected to it. And you should be able to update them all simultaneously, which is much quicker and much easier than having to take all your drones batteries out and in every five minutes. Much nicer process. Uh, just a quick note as well, that's also how you'll carry out firmware updates for your battery stations, should that be required. You plug it into the USB port on the front and into the USB port on the top of the controller. Okay, so now I want to talk about the different ways that batteries can present damage and other signs that it will need replacing. Okay, so the first and most obvious sign is visible swelling. The battery will puff up and swell, indicating there's internal leaking going on. This can be a really dangerous one, and if you notice this going on in your battery, you need to stop using it immediately. But we'll need to get it discharged and get it thrown away as quickly as possible. Um, I've not got an image on the slide, but it is quite obvious when um, when a drone is puffy, it's, it really increases in size and it will feel different to you. Uh, corrosion is another sign that as battery is damaged and in need of replacement. Uh, so this can prevent itself as cracks or scorch marks and leaks on the battery body or a discoloration on the metal terminals of the battery and the aircraft. Um, again, if this is present, then the battery will need to be disposed of. Um, if batteries do fail in this way, it's also important to thoroughly clean the aircraft battery port afterwards, just to make sure that the damage with the battery isn't carried over to your air aircraft. So um, you want to use the dry cloth and you want to thoroughly wipe the area, uh, particularly the metal pins that are the connection ports. Um, if there are any signs of corrosion, like the scorch marks or the cracks in the battery compartment, then you're going to want to send your drone for repair because obviously it will affect the airframe and the, um, the water ingress ratings and everything. So um, if the metal connection terminals on the battery are bent out of shape, it's another reason to dispose the battery. Uh, bent terminals can result in electrical ports, which will damage the drone circuit. If the terminals, so um, don't don't try and use tweezers to readjust the pins because you'll it's liable to break them or make further damage along the line. If you notice these issues, it's it's good to just set them off for repair and get them sorted out. But um, this 
this issue should never really arise, providing you're gentle with your batteries and you follow the correct procedure when you insert them and remove them from your drone. So hopefully none of you will have to deal with that. Uh, one of the less obvious ways to see that battery is um, at the end of its life is when it's reached 200 charge cycles. Um, so this essentially means the, the battery has been charged and discharged completely 200 times. So don't worry, you won't have to personally keep track of this, but the batteries will record their cycle count. And this can be viewed in the smart controller's battery settings menu. If you do go over, then um, it's good to dispose of the batteries because they won't function as intended anymore. Okay, so battery temperature. So when operating your drone, your battery temperature needs to be within an operational limit to function properly and as intended. So when, uh, if it's not within its temperature range, it can significantly affect the flight time of the aircraft as the resistance within the battery will go up and that will, that will negatively impact flight time. So intelligent flight batteries like you get with most of the, the new drones, they should um, automatically heat to within their operational temperature when installed and powered in the aircraft. But it's important to remember that auto heating will drain the charge of your aircraft slightly and negatively affect flight time. So it's not the best solution. You'll achieve best flight times if the batteries are stored and used when at ambient temperatures. Um, so as well, when it's not an intelligent flight battery, you need to remember to bring it to the right temperature before inserting it in your drone and flying. Uh, the self-heating function of the intelligent flight batteries can also be activated manually. And I'm going to be discussing this on the next slide. Okay, so as you can see here in this grid, we've got the main different battery types here. We've got the TB60, TB55, TB50, M2 Enterprise, and the P4. So as you can see, the first five there are all intelligent. They have a fairly similar operating temperature range and a fairly similar method of starting the self-heating process manually. Um, yeah, if you want to, um, you can bring your practice to temperature before you start flying, if you want to do that. Uh, as you can see with the P4, the P4 batteries do not have this self-heating function. So you need to bring them to temperature before you go flying. Okay, so charging. Uh, one of the most important ways to keep your battery healthy is charging them responsibly. It is recommended to only use the manufacturer charger that comes with the aircraft. Um, this is because different um, off-market chargers can, can have different current flow rates, and this can really negatively affect the lifespan of the battery. So always use the cables and the plugs you get with your drone. Um, if you're charging your battery to full, then you need to keep a close eye on the batteries and disconnect them when fully charged. Uh, most most uh, chargers should automatically stop the charging process when at 100%, but overcharging can negatively impact the battery's lifespan, so it's good to keep an eye on it and disconnect them as soon as they're done. Um, only charge a battery to full when it's intended to be used. Um, a battery charged to full will begin to discharge to 50% after about two days, so there's no, there's no point charging to 100% after a flight because it's just going to discharge itself anyway. And as well as that, a battery that consistently kept at 100% will have a negatively impacted lifespan. So um, if you're planning to leave your battery in storage, it's only, possible, it's only necessary to charge to between 40 and 60% really. Okay, so battery storage. As I said, you, wanna, you, only, you only want to be kept between 40 and 60%. Uh, I, went, I mainly want to talk through this graph here. So this graph shows how long a battery will last in storage before it's irreversibly damaged. As you can see, the lifespan is maximized when at 50% and the battery should last for approximately 250 days, although it isn't recommended to leave it untouched for more than 90. Uh, if your flight, if after a flight, your battery is under 40%, I strongly suggest charging it to 50%. Because as you can see, there's a serious drop off in how long these batteries will last after that. And again, if, if they go beyond that point, they're irreversibly damaged and you don't want to be using them. Um, charge dis discharge cycles are a good way to ensure that your batteries don't reach this maximum storage limit. 
and I'm going to go over that on the next slide. Yeah, a battery being completely discharged and recharged is known as a battery cycle. As stated previously, batteries have a set number of cycles they can complete before they're at the end of their lifespan. Uh, because of this, it's recommended that you keep the charge cycles of your batteries all the same and not favor one battery or battery set more than any others, as this can expand the lifespan of your batteries as a whole, instead of having some that are used consistently and some that are left in storage to get damaged. Uh, so like I said before, you can see that view the battery cycle count at any point in your, in your controller settings. So um, a, ch a charge discharge cycle can be useful for a couple of reasons. Uh, the process calibrates the drone's battery, ensuring the percentage freed out on the controller is accurate when flying. Um, so it also helps to maintain the lifespan, as I said, when it's in storage. So to complete a charge discharge cycle, you need to charge your battery to capacity and leave it standing for 24 hours, uh, no less than that. Uh, from that point, you want to discharge your battery to below 20%. So just take it out and fly it. You can have a bit of fun with it and just get it to below 20% and then leave it to stand for six hours. Uh, after that, insert it into your drone and you want to go to the battery settings and you're going to want to view the cell voltage. And you just want to take a note of what the cell voltage is reading. And then you want to repeat steps one through three. So you want to charge the battery to 100% again, discharge to 20%, and then check the cell voltage. And um, what you want to do then is you want to check that the voltage reading you got before is within 0.1 volts of the, the second reading you get. Um, if, if it is, then you everything's fine. If not, then um, something's wrong and you're going to need to change these batteries. Uh, it's important to note as well, I mean, the voltage per cell not the battery voltage. So there's multiple cells going on within your batteries. Okay, finally, we're gonna move on to safe disposal. Uh, as I've said, if a battery is damaged or faulty, it should be disposed of. It is annoying and it can be quite expensive to replace these batteries, uh, but it's a fraction of the cost of replacing a drone that's damaged because of a faulty battery. And I can assure you that's far more annoying. Uh, so LiPo batteries can be dangerous and volatile, and batteries that have not been thrown away properly have been known to combust and can cause quite serious damage. Uh, when a battery is completely flat, it no longer poses this hazard. Uh, because of this, it's essential to completely discharge them before you throw them away. Um, there have been cases of LiPo batteries being thrown away before this has happened, and they've started quite big fires in um, recycling centers and stuff. So. Um, you definitely need to be doing this before you throw them away. Uh, the easiest way to completely discharge a lipo is using a saltwater bath. Uh, salt water is very slightly conductive, so when a lipo battery is submerged in it, a small current will pass through and steadily discharge the battery. And um, through this, it'll also electrolysis will occur and break the, uh, the salt down. So um, the recommended ratio for this is about 30 grams of salt to every liter of water, but just roughly that and you should be fine. So you wanna sub completely submerge your batteries into this water and leave them for at least 24 hours, but we recommend leaving for about two weeks just to make sure there's no more current flowing out of those batteries. And once you've done that, um, yeah, it's safe to dispose of. So we just, recommend just putting in a little bit of packaging and taking it to a local recycling facility or e-waste bin uh, where you can just throw away it safely. Okay, so thank you for that, everyone. Uh, that's the end of my webinar. Have you got any questions for me? I'm happy to answer them.